we're in the 18th chapter of Shabbat. And until now, we've been we've had a series of eight Mishnayot, which have been talking about stuff which we might or might not want to handle on Shabbat, stuff which is muktzah. And maybe we don't handle it because it has no use on Shabbat, or maybe we don't handle it for other reasons. And there's the, the, the principle that we learned in the last chapter involved questions of need. Do we need it or do we not need it? Actually, the halacha says we can handle it if it's a kli, if it's a vessel, we can handle it whether we need it or don't need it. And the Gemara discusses what needing it means. Does it mean that we need the vessel itself for a purpose? Maybe we discussed last week, maybe we need a broken part of the vessel for a purpose. Do we need the vessel itself? Or maybe we need the space that the vessel is sitting in. Sometimes we move something just not because we need it itself, but because we need the space. And we're going to pick up this idea in the 18th chapter with stuff that is is not with with things which don't come into the category of vessels of clay. We know if it's a clay, we can move it on Shabbat. Lutzorech or not Lutzorech, either way. But now we're going to get into all kinds of other things which are not kalim, but we are nevertheless going to move on Shabbat if we need the space. Mufanim afilu. Our Babachamesh Kupot Shell Tevin. We're going to clear away even four or five baskets of straw. Veshel Tvoa or produce. Mipneha or Chim ub Mipne Bitul Beit Hamidrash. To make room for guests or because there's um, to because there's a problem with a, a, a lack of space in the Beit Midrash. We're losing out on learning because there's no space for people to sit. So, and really interesting, by the way, that the Mishnah is saying here that Talmud Torah and welcoming guests are both equally important here. We don't put one over the other. They're both equally important. And we move stuff around for either purpose. Aval, the Mishnah says, lo et outsar, not for the storehouse. We wouldn't do this to clear out space in the storehouse. In other words, we don't rearrange our storehouse on Shabbat. That's the rabbis would consider that shvut, a, a sort of a, a sort of a prohibition against the prohibition of it's not resting to move stuff around your storehouse on Shabbat, even though theoretically you might be able we're not carrying the public domain so what kind of things would we clear away well we're going to continue mufanim truma torah we can clear away pure truma udmai doubtfully tithe produce Maaseri Shon, Shnitla Truma, first tithe whose truma has been separated, redeemed second tithe, sanctified things, dry haturmus hayavesh. This is dry lupine. This is some kind of a vegetable. Mi humachala izim, because it's food for goats. Some people think that the text should read, by the way, ma'achala aniyim. You can see that if we change that nun to a zayin or the zayin to a nun, la izim in the word izim, we could change la izim to la aniim. And I looked at the Kaufman manuscript just before, just earlier this afternoon, and the Kaufman definitely has izim. But there are respectable academics who read aniim there, food for poor people. But there are certain things which really do have no use on Shabbat. So these really are muktzah. We're not going to move in any circumstances. Not untithe produce or first tithe whose truma hasn't been taken. Because we can't we can't eat these at all. We can't do anything with these on Shabbat. And same for unredeemed second tithe and sanctified things. Or luf or mustard. Veloita luf veloita chardal. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel matir beluf mipnei shehu machal orvin. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel permits with luf because it's food for ravens. In other words, it does have some purpose. And just as we feed animals on Shabbat, you know, we were feeding the goats in the middle part of the Mishnah, we might feed ravens. Now, why luf should be food for ravens, I'm not sure. And when we learned the Mishnah of to Rumor, we learned that luf is, according to Jastro anyway, is colocasia. It's a plant that's got a, 
uh, green leafy top that we can eat. And it also has these potato like tubers that we can store and eat. So luff is colocausia. Why ravens eat it, I'm not sure. But the Mishnah certainly rules that if it has a use as a food, even for animals, we can move it around on Shabbat to make space for guests. And in the same lines, Chavilei Kesh, Chavilei Kash, Chavilei Etzim, Chavilei Zeradim, bundles of straw or twigs or young shoots. Im hit im hit kinan l'ma'achal behemar. If they were prepared as animal food, See, we're not again. This is not human food we're talking about here. But these could be animal fuel, food, or perhaps they could be fuel. Well, we're not going to we're not going to burn on Shabbat, so clearly we're not going to move them around if they're fuel. But if they're food, metal to lin or tam, we can move them around. Ve'im love ain metal to lin or tam. If they're not animal food, in other words, if we're you know if if it's if it's um, kindling. For a fire, we're not going to move those around on Shabbat. And here we're talking about real mukta here. I don't think here we're talking about getting things ready for guests. We could um, overturn a basket before young birds so they will get up and then get down. And I'm not really sure what is going on here. Why these we want to persuade these birds to jump up and all down on a basket. Tarnagolet shit barachana. If a chicken's run away, and clearly there's a, it, it's obvious really why we need to deal with a chicken that's run away, because that we you know we're going to suffer financial loss and we're going to lose our eggs and our meat if we can't get this chicken back. Tarnagolet shit baracha dochin ota ad shet tikanes. We're going to give her a little push until she comes back inside the farmyard. So, so somehow we are not guilty of hunting. If we do this, and a couple of chapters ago, when we learned about hunting, we learned that the issue of hunting doesn't apply to domesticated animals. They're considered already hunted. Madadin agala, um, we madadin agalim besachin birushut arabim. We can make calves and foals walk in the public domain. Isha mudada, isha mudada, banana woman can make her son walk. Amar Rabbi Yuda, time. Rabbi Yuda says, okay, what are we really talking about here when we say a woman can make her son walk? Interestingly, how gendered this Mishnah is. When he lifts one foot and places it down, but if he drags the balom, it's forbidden. So it, it's as if, now we know that we've already learned the principle, chai no say it at small. Um, a living thing carries itself. We learn that a human being, for example, if we can, we can carry him out in a bed and we don't even have to worry about carrying the bed on Shabbat because of the doctrine that a chai no say, that's more. Here we seem to be talking about someone who can't work, walk at all, maybe a baby. And that's why the issue, the principle of chai no say, that's more, a living thing carries itself, might not apply to someone who, who can't walk at all. And then the Mishnah is going to move on to um, it's going to move on to to birth. We don't deliver an animal on a festival. And that means effectively, you know, we're talking about reaching a hand into the womb of a calf, which is just giving birth in order to help out the fetus. Alva. Aval Musadim, but we can assist it. And the Rambami, or the Bartanur actually explains that we're talking about, for example, catching the animal when it comes out, helping it down. The Rambam mentions helping the animal to kneel so it can give birth easily. So we can help the animal, but we don't break Shabbat to essentially deliver a to deliver an animal fetus. And that's not the case with um because we don't break Shabbat for the health of an animal. But Shabbat, but we do deliver a, a pregnant woman on Shabbat. And we're going to call a midwife for her from place to place. So 
The midwife may be more than 2,000 amot away. She may be a significant distance away, but we're going to call her. We're going to essentially allow her to break Shabbat in order to come and, and help the birth take place. And the Mishnah is clear. We're going to break the Shabbat on her behalf. We're going to tie up the um, umbilical cord. And Rabbi Yossi says, the halacha goes according to Rabbi Yossi, by the way. Rabbi Yossi says, Af chotchin. We're going to cut the umbilical cord as well on Shabbat. And all the requirements of circumcision may also be done on Shabbat. Now, the requirements of circumcision are dealt with in the next chapter of the Mishnah, chapter 19. And we don't need to speak more about them here. But we should just spend a minute, if we can, if we've got just a minute left over, on the midwife. And the Mishnah, this Mishnah should remind us about a Mishnah in Rosh Hashanah, about the witnesses who come to give evidence about the new moon. And the Mishnah there, there says, look, there was a large courtyard in Jerusalem and it was called by Yazek and all the witnesses to the new moon used to assemble there and the court would examine them. And because they wanted to encourage the witnesses to come, they'd make a feast for them there on Shabbat. So when a witness came, he would go to that. They would go to this place and they would they'd have a meal after they'd given evidence. And originally they didn't used to leave the place the whole day. But Rabban Gamliel decreed that they could go 2,000 cubits, 2,000 amot from it in any direction. In other words, once they'd arrived there, they were considered as if they were resident in the town. They could do anything that a resident in the town could. And the Mishnah continues. Velo elu bilvad. And not only these. Eila af. Also a midwife who's come to deliver a child. So a midwife who's come to deliver a child is considered like an ordinary resident of the town and they can take advantage of all the facilities in the town, even if they've come on Shabbat. And the Rambam Paskans, this is this is now from the Mishnei Torah of, of the Rambam, when a woman starts to uh, go into labor, her life's considered in danger. And the, all the Sabbath laws may be violated on her behalf. And then he quotes our Mishnah. He calls a midwife from place to place. We cut the umbilical cord. He's quoting Rabbi Yossi in our Mishnah. And we tie it up. And then he adds a very interesting halacha. Im haitat If she requires a light when she cries out because of her pangs, a candle is lit for her. And he continues. Suma. Even if she's blind. It's a fascinating psychological insight of the Rambam. Even if she's blind and she can't see the light. We still break Shabbat to light a light for her on Shabbat. Because the, knowing that the light is there somehow settles her light, settles her mind. It makes her feel more comfortable. Even though she cannot see the light. We light a light to make her feel more comfortable on Shabbat, even though we know that she cannot physically see it.